Welcome to the Great Fire of London, uncovering the truths behind the most terrible blaze in British history. We're following in the footsteps of the flames and witnessing the devastation the fire unleashed on the capital. 350 years ago, the flames raged for four days and nights through those streets behind us. The blaze burned down nearly all the buildings within the city walls. It destroyed homes, livelihoods and lives. Over the last two nights, we've already established exactly where the blaze began. We've followed in the footsteps of the fire and we've witnessed great buildings fall as the fire spreads through the city, from the area around Pudding Lane to St Paul's. Now in this programme, we'll find out what ultimately stopped the Great Fire of London and how the city rebuilt itself from the ashes. Tonight, I'll be investigating how many victims died as a result of the fire. Can we really trust the official records? The official death toll is, is just half a dozen people, and to me, that is absolutely ludicrous. I'll be examining the desperate measures taken to fight the blaze. Oh, there it goes again. That's hot. And I'll be walking the route in the fire's final hours, tracking down just where the flames went out. This is the point where the Great Fire of London stopped. Dawn on September the 5th, 1666. For the last three nights, a strong wind has been blowing a raging fire west through the city of London. But overnight, that wind has changed direction, and now the fire is moving back east towards this place, the Tower of London. In 1666, the tower is one of the most important buildings, not just in London, but in the whole country. It's the safe where the king keeps his crown jewels. It's a jail for high-profile prisoners and it's stuffed with valuable stock belonging to London's goldsmiths, placed there to keep it safe from the fire. But most terrifying of all is that the Tower of London is the biggest ammunition dump in the entire country, because behind those 15-foot wide walls are 9,000 barrels of gunpowder, and if the fire touches those, well, it's gonna create the biggest explosion that Londoners have ever witnessed. So far, nothing has been immune from destruction. By Wednesday, the city has been on fire for four days. From the Pudding Lane area, the fires raged towards the Thames, destroying homes and warehouses before burning the financial center of the city to the ground, including the Royal Exchange. And then on the third day, London's most famous building, St Paul's Cathedral, was wiped out by the flames. But as the fire closes in on the Tower of London, it seems that the worst is yet to come. The people around here must have been absolutely terrified. No one's been left untouched, including our three Londoners, who we've been following throughout this whole trail of devastation. Across the series, we've been uncovering the fates of three very different London residents, who all lived in the direct path of the Great Fire. A shoemaker, Sybil Tame. A rich goldsmith banker, Robert Viner. And a bookseller, Joshua Curtin. But what happened to them as fire engulfed the city? St Paul's Cathedral churchyard was full of bookshops at the time of the fire. When the cathedral burned down, it took thousands of pounds worth of goods with it. One Londoner who'd lost all his stock was Joshua Curtin. Like many booksellers, he'd been based in St Paul's churchyard and he had thought that the stone cathedral would be the safest place to store everything he owned. Joshua lost all his books and with them his livelihood. It was too much for him to bear. Despite having had a thriving business before, he couldn't recover from such a catastrophe. Sinking further and further into debt, he died after the Great Fire utterly penniless. 
Robert Viner, one of the wealthiest men in England, initially fared better. He saved all of his belongings from his magnificent home in Lombard Street 24 hours before the fire burnt it to the ground. Ever the canny businessman, within a few days he was up and running again. But the great fire hadn't finished with Robert Viner yet. Our third Londoner, shoemaker and widowed mother of three, Sybil Tain, was truly unlucky. Her workshop in Christ Hospital was one of the few buildings in her street to be completely destroyed by the fire. She lost everything. We know from records that Sybil took shelter in nearby Christ Hospital orphanage. Made homeless like so many other Londoners, she would have to find a new way to survive. It's now 6 a.m. on Wednesday the 5th of September. And a great fire is advancing towards the Tower of London at frightening speed. The goldsmith stocks worth more than a million pounds today. Well, they've been moved from here, upriver, to the King's Palace of Whitehall. And dockers from Woolwich and Deptford have finally arrived on the scene. It's going to be their job to save the tower from destruction. But the newly arrived firefighters have only one reliable source of water, the River Thames. Protecting the tower was by far their biggest challenge. The problem was the technology for putting out fires, well, it was pretty pitiful. In 1666, fire engines were rudimentary, and although they had equipment called fire squirts, which operated like big syringes, they could only hold small amounts of water. There was no proper fire service. In fact, there wasn't much more than long chains of people carrying buckets of water like this up from the Thames. As the minutes ticked away on the morning of Wednesday the 5th of September, it must have been chaos around the tower as people watched the approaching flames with horror. After the break, we'll discover the desperate measures that were taken to prevent the Tower of London from being blown to kingdom come. Welcome back. We're now four days into the worst fire in British history, and I'm walking the route to its terrifying conclusion. It's now 7 a.m. on Wednesday the 5th of September. Fire has already destroyed the financial, religious and legal centres of the city and over 13,000 homes. It now has its sights on the most important fortress in the country, the Tower of London. I'm meeting historian Professor Ronald Hutton from the University of Bristol. Ronald, why is it so important to stop the fire getting to the Tower of London? Because it's the biggest government munitions store in the entire country. There are hundreds of barrels of gunpowder there. If the fire detonates those, it'll be like a low-level nuclear device. All the housing for miles around, all the shipping in the port of London and London Bridge are going to vanish in a flash. By Wednesday the 5th of September, things were looking desperate. The path of the fire had to be stopped by any means necessary. But what methods were available, apart from buckets, in 1666? Now this is the modern day equivalent of what was called a fire hook. This is actually much smaller than what was used back then. Theirs were about three times the length of this much heavier. It would take up to three men to actually carry the thing. But the idea was, with this great long pole and a hook on the end of it, they'd hoist it up onto the timbers of the houses and just yank them down. Primitive stuff. They called these gaps created by tearing down houses fire breaks. At the Fire Service College in Gloucestershire, I'm investigating how they worked. 
we've set up replica models of the houses typically found 350 years ago. In the middle, we've created a fire break, as they would have done with the fire hook. We've torn down the house in the middle with the idea that if this house was on fire, this one over here will be safe. We've created a gap in the middle. We've created that fire break. Let's light her up and see how it works. There it goes. Just like in 1666, the house is ablaze within minutes. What a sacrifice to have to make, to have your house reduced to rubble for the sake of London. There was no insurance at the time. With no fire brigade and only basic equipment, fire breaks were one of the few weapons that could fight the fast-moving flames. But this method had a fatal flaw. Oh, things are moving. God, that is an intense fire now. The flames quickly spread using the remains of the building in the middle. By leaving the debris from the torn down house in place, the firefighters had provided even more fuel for the fire to feed on. I'm not holding out much hope for how long that house stands up. For the first two days of the Great Fire, Londoners desperately pulled down houses, but couldn't clear them away in time. This made it easier for the blaze to spread to the next house. Oh, there it goes again. Oh, yeah, that's hot. Leaving the debris behind meant the fire could rage unchecked. Radical measures were needed. Houses were still pulled down, but this time, firefighters cleared away the remains as quickly as possible. I want to see how this proved to be a turning point in the Great Fire of London. For this test, we've removed the debris that was left between the houses. With no fuel there, the fire has nowhere to go, at least in theory. Let's test it out. You can see the flames kicking out the right-hand side of the house, but because we've removed all the debris in the fire break, they have nothing to catch hold of. That fire is being contained on that one house. The one on the right is still very much intact. Oh, the house is coming down. Even when the house collapses, the gap is still big enough to stop our fire spreading. If only they created these fire breaks early on in the Great Fire of London. Well, you can see right there, the fire has been prevented from spreading over to the next house. It's now 7.30 a.m. on Wednesday the 5th of September. And Londoners wait with bated breath to see if fire breaks can save the tower. How did they stop the fire from reaching the Tower of London? They demolished the housing near the tower with gunpowder and create level scorched earth between the flames and the tower. Ironically, gunpowder is used to save the gunpowder. Once the firefighters realised that gunpowder could create fire breaks more quickly, they were able to contain the fire and prevent a far worse tragedy. The tower was safe. London had been saved from a massive explosion, but death was still stalking the streets of the city. We know from eyewitness accounts that an old lady and an old man burned to death seeking shelter here at St Paul's, but the precise number of people who died during the Great Fire has been a mystery for centuries. It's time to find out how many really died. Official estimates put the death toll at just six people. This might seem suspicious, especially given how long the fire lasted and how vast the trail of devastation it left. It's baffling that we don't have a definitive number, 
especially given that the authorities actually kept incredibly detailed records into how many people died in 17th century London. Held at the London Metropolitan Archives, the bills of mortality, as they're known, record how individuals met their ends in the ordinary course of events, down to the goriest and grisliest of details. Historian Professor Vanessa Harding has been researching them. Do you have a favourite cause of death, if one could ask such a strange question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose that this is a man found dead in the common sewer at St Catherine by the Tower. That sounds like a particularly horrible way to die. I'm sure it is, yes, yes. Even those who didn't die face down in sewage have their deaths carefully noted in the records of 1666. 22 died of dropsy, or swelling due to fluid. 15 perished after a fever, and 10 expired from griping in the guts. And we have some other ones here as well. Scalded in a brewer's mash fat at Stepney. Oh, that sounds yes. like a horrible way to go. Yes. So if we turned to September 1666, huh, there seems to be some pages missing here. What can it tell us about the Great Fire? Uh, it tells us basically that the printing press and that the reporting of deaths both broke down at the time of the fire. So in that sense, they cannot tell us anything about how many people died. Given that we do have this absence, this gap in the records, in terms of recording how many people died. Does that not suggest that many, many people might have died in the Great Fire? Many people might have died, but I don't think that they did. By this time, this is a society that is so full of news and information and gossip that if there had been a major loss of life, somebody would have known about it and many people would have talked about it. But other historians think some Londoners could have slipped through the net and died without trace. Could the death toll actually be in the hundreds, even the thousands? Historian Neil Hansen has written a book about deaths caused by the Great Fire. He has a controversial new argument. So, Neil, you have a theory, don't you, about how many people died in the Great Fire? I do. The, the official death toll is, is just half a dozen people. And to me, that is absolutely ludicrous. When every other great fire disaster in history has claimed tens, hundreds, thousands of lives. So you think that there are vast numbers of people who, who just disappeared and we have no record of them? My belief is that hundreds, possibly even thousands of people died in the fire of London. But because they were the poor, nobody cared whether they lived or died. But their deaths simply went unrecorded. London's poor occupied a warren of blind alleys and closed courts down by the river, some of the most run-down, most flammable buildings in the city. When the Great Fire struck, this whole area was destroyed. One of the king's most senior courtiers remarked that the fire was the greatest blessing that God ever conferred upon the king because it had eradicated the slums and tenements down by the river and the poor who lived in them, festering sources of the plague, but also festering sources of criminality and opposition to the king. Where were all these poor that you think died in the fire then? The reason there were no bodies was not because people hadn't died. It was because the bodies had been utterly destroyed in the fire. In the last programme, Rob discovered what the searing heat of the Great Fire, reaching over 1,000 oh, wow. degrees, could do to metal. Look at that. But could these temperatures be enough to consume a human body? If you're going to cremate a body, you need a temperature of 750 degrees for about an hour to an hour and a half. You don't need to add any heat source after that. The body will burn on the fat stored within the body. And all you'll be left with is a couple of pounds of grey dust and a few fragments of bone, no bigger than that sort of size. The fires of London were probably twice as hot as that, certainly hot enough to melt iron and steel. The great iron bars of Newgate Jail, thick as a man's wrist, they were melted in the fire, the locks and chains of the city's gates. So the temperature was that hot. It was sustained for hours, days and even weeks. It's actually terrifying, the idea that there might have been hundreds or thousands of people who just disappeared. Of course, the fit and the able-bodied would have escaped. But what about the very young, the very old, the halt, the sick and the lame? How could they possibly have escaped from this inferno? By Wednesday afternoon, tearing down whole streets and clearing the rubble to make fire breaks is beginning to work. But that wasn't all slowing the spread of the fire. 
Around four in the afternoon, after four days of terrible gales, the wind that had been fanning the flames finally dropped. The fire lost its brutal ferocity. Little by little, house by house, the great fire came under control as the falling wind and the fire breaks did their work. One place that shows where the fire was extinguished is Merchant Taylor's Hall in Threadneedle Street, the trade guild that represented Taylor's. Much of the building was gutted by the flames. This beautiful hall dates from after the Great Fire of London, and one reason for that is because it was all destroyed during the fire. But the room holds one incredible secret, and to find it, you've got to look behind this wooden panelling. Now, if you come in here, you can still see the old medieval walls and ceiling of old Merchant Taylor's Hall. And on that side, everything survived the fire but on this side, everything was destroyed. So I'm actually standing on the limit of where the fire reached. This is the point where the Great Fire of London stopped. By Wednesday evening, with two thirds of the buildings inside the city walls destroyed, tens of thousands of people made homeless, and what would now be billions of pounds worth of property destroyed, the Great Fire was finally over. But the city was on its knees. And for those who'd survived, in many ways, the worst was yet to come. Welcome back. It's Thursday, the day after the Great Fire ended. Now, the flames may be out, but the city is broken and the people have been battered. I'm tracing what happened to Londoners in the days that followed. The story takes me out of the centre into the fields of Hampstead, north of the city. Now it's very much part of London, but back then it would have been rural farms and villages. If you'd looked out over this view in September 1666, not only would you have seen enormous plumes of smoke rising into the upper atmosphere and alarming orange flames on the horizon, but you'd have seen masses of desperate people trudging in this direction in search of food and shelter. The fire had caused a refugee crisis on an unprecedented scale. Within a matter of days, around 100,000 Londoners had lost their homes and were flooding into the open spaces surrounding the city. This is Parliament Hill in North London. It's calm, peaceful, a relief from the hubbub of the city. But just hours after the fire had started, it had been transformed into a vast refugee camp. With so many people on the brink of starvation, something had to be done. It was a tense situation. The authorities had to act. I'm finding out what happened with food historian Mark Meltonville. Mark, there must have been a real food crisis after the fire. Is that right? Yeah, no, it's, it's a disaster. Upwards of you know, 100,000 people homeless. And the one thing they haven't got is anything to eat or anything to drink. But London's starving residents were saved by a stroke of good fortune. The one thing that was really lucky for everyone was it was September, the harvest team. There is food all across Britain, and that food, fire or not, was already heading down to the London market. What you have to do is set up places for people to get to that food, because it, it's on its way. The government organised temporary markets so people could buy and sell produce. It also looked for more immediate solutions to the crisis, releasing military rations to feed the refugees. One of the ideas was to use the supplies of army and navy biscuits. So what is this ship's biscuit? They are flour, water and salt. That, they call the horse feed, taken away. And, as you're finding, almost totally unbreakable. So how do they eat it? If you just chew on that, you, you can slowly crumble it away. But I wouldn't risk my crowns on there if I was you. <laughs> but the ship's biscuits 
couldn't compete with the fresh food already pouring into London's emergency markets. When the authorities got there with their biscuits, everyone went, mm, uh, no, it's all right. I think we'll stick with the bread and cheese, thanks very much. The survivors of the fire now had food, but they still had no money or livelihood. They desperately needed cash to keep them going into winter. One man who witnessed their plight was writer Samuel Pepys. We think of the welfare state as a modern idea. But in fact, the 17th century had its own system of financial relief to help the victims of major disasters like the Great Fire. And it was at churches like this one, St. Olaf's Heart Street, Pepys' own church, that people were encouraged to dig deep into their pockets and help support the victims. Miraculously, the Great Fire stopped just a few hundred yards short of St. Olaf's, so the church was spared. A few days after the fire ended, Samuel Pepys attended a service here. In his diary, Pepys describes how our parson made a melancholy but good sermon, and many and most in the church cried, especially the women. He would have been sitting almost exactly where I am now when he heard that, and reading his diary, it's clear that the church was full of distraught Londoners, many of whom had been made homeless by the fire and who needed every little bit of help that they could get. Historian Dr. Jacob Field has been researching how the church provided poor relief for impoverished Londoners in the months after the fire. How did this poor relief fund work? Was it like, I don't know, sport relief today or poppy aid? Very similar. So about a month after the fire, Charles II issued a proclamation, basically asking all of the parishes in England and Wales to hold a collection to raise money for the poor people of London to help them in their recovery from the fire. And did it work? It worked fairly well. The two most generous counties were Yorkshire, which gave about £1,200, and Devon, which raised £1,500. And where were the stingy places? Well, unfortunately, I have to point the finger at Wales. The whole of the principality gave just £33 to the collection. So to give some idea of a comparison, this church, uh, St Olaf Hart Street, gave £30 to the collection as well. So one London parish gave about the same amount as all of Wales. Did they not care about London? I think people did care, but you have to remember, at the time this collection was made, uh, England was at war, they were just recovering from a bout of plague, and they'd just given money to a big relief fund to help out plague victims. So there was, a sense, some compassion fatigue at the time. It's now the evening of Thursday 6th of September. And although the fire is finally out, the homeless living in green spaces around the city are becoming restless and anxious. To prevent rioting, a legal process was set up known as fire courts. Fire courts were to compensate people for their losses, but also to resolve disputes between tenants and landlords. Because there was no fire insurance, right? That's right. And in fact, most people at the time rented, and their leases said that they had to pay for any damage, and they had to continue to pay rent on the buildings, even though they no longer existed. Well, hold on, hold on. They had to rebuild their houses, even though they didn't own them. I know. That's completely shocking. outrageous. Charles II had said that the fire was an act of God, and this meant the tenants had to pay. So what were most people doing, just sleeping out in places like this? Yes, I mean, people stayed here for up to eight years. The majority then went home, but 25% of people never returned. We've been following the stories of three Londoners, tracking down their homes and finding out how the Great Fire changed their lives forever. We saw earlier how the fire drove bookseller Joshua Curtin to his death. Now we can discover the fate the fire had in store for our two other Londoners, banker Robert Viner and shoemaker Sybil Tame. Sybil lived in Christ's Hospital near St Bart's. Sybil Tame was a widow with three children to feed. She earned her living as a shoemaker at Christ's Hospital School. She had a rocky relationship with the school authorities for entertaining men in her rooms late at night. When the flames destroyed her home and workshop, she was left destitute. <laughs> 
As a result of the Great Fire, Sybil was forced to give up shoemaking altogether. But she was nothing if not enterprising, and determined to make a living, she begged the school authorities for permission to set up a stall selling alcohol on the grounds. But we know from records of the time, her new venture didn't last long. Over the years of her career at Christ Hospital, Sybil had been in trouble with the school authorities on many occasions. But when she plied a young Cambridge scholar with drink, the school decided enough was enough. She was ordered to shut down her liquor stall and sell off all her stock. We don't know if Sybil ever worked as a shoemaker again, but she did leave something behind. And it's here, deep within the vaults of the Museum of London. I've got something really exciting here, something that has survived for 350 years. And if it's going to survive for another 350, I need to put these on before I touch it. It's something very tiny, but something really important. It's a trade token that shoemakers used as a form of credit. But it's not just any trade token. On it, it says Christ for Christ Hospital. And then, and this is just wondrous, it says Sybil Tame. In other words, it has her name on it. This is something she had made and she issued. And in the center, it has a picture of a shoe and two stars. So this is like her logo. So isn't this incredible? Something from Sybil Tame survives to this day. Over in Lombard Street, our third Londoner, wealthy goldsmith banker Robert Viner, had made a very smart decision. A day before the fire reached his house, he arranged to have his most precious valuables moved to Windsor Castle, home of his friend, King Charles II. The fact that Charles granted Robert Viner special permission to hide his things at Windsor was hardly surprising, given that Viner had been funding Charles's extravagant lifestyle for years. The king was literally in his debt. But Robert Viner had made a fatal mistake in lending money to a king a spendthrift like Charles was more interested in protecting himself than paying back his creditors. After the fire, King Charles II realised that his indulgent lifestyle and the vast cost of the war against the Dutch had left him with a bill that he wasn't prepared to pay. In a sly and devastating move, the king cancelled his debts, creating chaos in the financial markets. For Robert Viner, this was a disaster. The king owed him the equivalent of 30 million pounds in today's money, and now he wasn't prepared to pay it back. With no chance of having his loans repaid, Robert Viner was plunged into debt. The man who had made the king's own crown was declared bankrupt. The demands from creditors, combined with the death of his son, broke Robert Viner's heart. He died penniless. Friday, September the 7th, 1666. The Great Fire has now been over for two days, but London is still reeling from the disaster. Although the fire had rampaged through London, it had actually spared a lot of the city's hospitals, including the one here at Smithfield, St Bartholomew's, or as we call it today, St Bart's. Now we know from eyewitness accounts that men were turning up here wounded and sick, presumably with very serious burns, and they were treated with a variety of extraordinary remedies. At the time of the Great Fire, modern medicine didn't exist. Medical care was still based on ancient theories and herbal remedies administered by the pharmacists of the day, apothecaries. People at home also concocted their own treatments using plants, honey, and even snails. The Royal College of Physicians has a collection of handwritten books containing remedies for burns that would have been used during the Great Fire. I'm meeting Dr. Henry Oakley. 
I've got one recipe here. Against a burn or scold, first to fetch out the fire. Fetch out the fire means fetch out the heat to remove the pain. OK. Apply the juice of the dung of a horse at grass. So there's a bit of horse dung juice there. Oh, it really is quite powerful. Would this have had any benefit to a burn? This would be full of bacteria. If you put this on anything more than just a superficial scald, it would cause you to have septicemia and you'd be dead in a few days. So rather than treating the burn, you'd actually cause it more harm? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's in one of the recipe books. Back in 1666, one of the other recipes featured ground ivy. I'm going to have a go at mixing up the treatment myself. Boil the juice of Gilgoy by ground, which is a type of ivy. Ground ivy, yes. Called ale hoof, in cream till it comes to an oil and apply it till it be whole. So we have some ale hoof or yes. ground ivy here. Let's try that. Ale hoof would remove scabs and things like that. So you put it on and it would help get rid of those incrustations. So you'd have pink raw flesh, which would heal up nicely. I grind down the ivy until it produces an oil and mix it with cream to form a paste. It says go on putting this on until the burn is whole. So if I get a little bit out of here... Yes, stick it on. Get that on there. Let's pretend I have a burn here on my wrist. Yes, you could apply this to it like that. But these recipes weren't always accurately written down. This one actually recommends the wrong ivy. Am I safe with this on here now? I should have asked this earlier. I would wipe it off now if I was you. Fair enough. Another remedy looks a bit more promising. It suggests using poppy sap, otherwise known as morphine, mixed with the sap from poplar trees. Poplar ointment would still be effective to this day. The pain of the burn would have been well dealt with by morphine, and the sap of the poplar tree would be sterile, have no bacteria in it, and it would resist infection. That sounds a lot more applicable than our um, horse dung juice. Absolutely. The Londoners of 1666 looked around at their ruined city and were broken hearted. An eyewitness account of the days after the fire describes clambering over mountains of yet smoking rubbish and frequently mistaking where I was the ground under my feet so hot has made me not only sweat, but even burned the soles of my shoes. As people started to take in the vast trail of destruction the Great Fire had left, they began to realise that with only a few exceptions, the old city was gone forever, and there was no way that it could ever be rebuilt. After the break, a new London emerges from the ashes. Welcome back. And finally, we've moved forward a few months from all the terrible destruction. The flames are out, the wounded are being tended to, and care for the vast number of refugees is actually surprisingly well organised. It's time for London to look to the future, to rebuild itself from the ashes. The city had learned a hard lesson from the damage caused by the Great Fire. From now on, stronger fire regulations came into force and there was more control over home building. New houses had to be made from brick and not from flammable timber. Wooden window frames were no longer allowed to jut out from walls and wooden jetties like this one, well, they were banned to stop flames leaping across narrow streets. The number of stories a house could have was also restricted. For the first time, London had elegant rows of brick terraced houses. Now there's a house down this street I really want to show you. It's number five to six Crane Court. It's brick built, it's flat fronted, it's a world away from those Tudor, timber framed, higgledy piggledy houses of old London. And there's a reason for that. 
because this place originally dates to 1670. It was built by Nicholas Barbon, the man who started London's first fire insurance company. This uniform, flat-fronted look became fashionable all over the country with elegant terraces in places like Bath and Brighton. Britain was changing. London's physical layout altered as well, as I found out when I met up with Professor Ronald Hutton. Ronald, how did the Great Fire change London's landscape? Well, there is no London anymore. London is buried under six feet of charred rubble. Some of this can be shipped up river and dumped, but most of it is spread across what have been the houses and the streets to level the ground, and that prepares the way for the rebuilding. And who were the key characters behind the rebuilding? Well, my hero is a guy called Robert Hooke, who is just a brilliant surveyor. And realising the priority is to get the city working again, he rapidly goes out with planning, cordoning off, plotting, and this means the city gets rebuilt with amazing speed. So, presumably, this was a great opportunity to reimagine London? Oh, it certainly was. Thanks to the skill of planners like Robert Hooke, incredibly, just ten years after the Great Fire, most of the city was up and running again. These days, London is a bustling hub of activity, as it has been for centuries. The old houses and churches now overshadowed by office blocks and skyscrapers. The most famous symbol of the Great Fire is this, the monument Sir Christopher Wren and Robert Hooke were commissioned to build shortly after the fire. When the monument was built, London's skyline was much lower than it is now, so for years this would have towered over everything around it. Wren built it to be exactly 202 feet tall. So if you took it and lay it down on its side, the top would land just in front of that blue car exactly where Thomas Farriner's bakery was and where the Great Fire of London first started. As we've already discovered, the precise spot where it began isn't in Pudding Lane, but in what is now Monument Street. We now know from new evidence that the Great Fire of London almost certainly started right here from a spark in Thomas Farriner's bakery. Now, Farriner did his best to distance himself from any blame, even helping to send a poor, confused Frenchman, Robert Hubert, to his death. But there's a twist to the tale, because in 1986, the worshipful company of bakers issued an apology on Thomas Farriner's behalf, only 320 years too late. But for me, the monument symbolises something far more poignant. Now, I look at the monument now, and I can't help thinking about a lost London, and of the heroism of all the men and women and children who did their best to battle the blaze. People like our Londoners, who lost everything as a result of the fire. And it makes you realise that the Great Fire of London is a part of our national consciousness and of our whole country's history. Well, that's the end of our journey through the Great Fire of London. And it's been incredible to see how it changed history and shaped London today. For me, the most extraordinary thing was experiencing the power of the fire and the bravery of those people who attempted to put it out armed with the most basic equipment. I loved going down into that crypt under St Paul's and seeing where the poor booksellers had put their books, hoping they'd escape from the fire. For me, it was the human side of the story, holding that actual trade token from Sybil Tame, feeling that connection with a Londoner from the time of the Great Fire, it was extraordinary. It's been fascinating spending three nights walking in the footsteps of the Great Fire of London. <laughs>